Ladies and gentlemen, mesdames et messieurs, veuillez accueillir votre animatrice. Please welcome your MC for the evening from the Ottawa Citizen, la rédactrice en chef, the editor in chief, Michelle Richardson. Bonsoir and good evening. I first want to thank the NNA organizers for having me here tonight. A Michelle hosting a journalism gala? What could possibly go wrong? In keeping with a new tradition that began last year, we're going to dispense at any lame attempts at inside jokes and instead focus on celebrating fabulous journalism. Ce soir, nous célébrons le meilleur du journalisme canadien. It's a tremendous honor to be in the company of so many outstanding journalists. What we do has never been more important than it is right now. The amazing work we're celebrating tonight shows how strong a profession we have, even in the face of financial and political challenges. C'est tout un honneur d'être en compagnie d'un si grand nombre de journalistes exceptionnels. Notre métier n'a jamais été aussi important qu'il est aujourd'hui. L'excellence du travail que nous célébrons ce soir démontre à quel point notre profession est résiliente. Tonight, we will announce the winners of 21 categories. At the end of the evening, we will unveil the Journalist of the Year for 2017. But even those who do not come up here to accept an award have done fabulous work. Ce soir, nous annoncerons les lauréats dans 21 catégories et, à la fin de la soirée, nous dévoilerons le nom du ou de la Journaliste de l'année pour 2017. Ceux et celles qui ne monteront pas ici ce soir pour recevoir un prix ont fait un travail digne de notre reconnaissance. Je voudrais demander à tous les finalistes de se lever pour une bonne main d'applaudissement grandement méritée. I'd like to ask all of the finalists to please stand so that we can give them the round of applause they so richly deserve. These awards could not be given without the hard work and dedication of the 66 judges. Some of them are here tonight, and the full list of judges appears in your program. Ces prix n'auraient pas pu être décernés sans le travail et le dévouement des 66 juges. Certains d'entre eux sont ici ce soir, et la liste complète des juges se trouve dans votre programme. Could we please have a round of applause for the judges? Nous tenons à remercier nos commanditaires qui ont rendu possible cet hommage à votre travail. We would also like to thank our sponsors who've made this tribute to your work possible. First of all, our platinum sponsor, Post Media. Many, many thanks for your continuing support of this awards program. Thank you as well to the Globe and Mail for serving as our premier sponsor. Et à nos autres commanditaires, The Alliance for Audited Media, Brissenis Jacobson, Blakes, The Canadian Press, Cision, Glacier Media, News Media Canada, The Toronto Star, and The Winnipeg Free Press. Before we begin presenting awards, we have a special announcement to make, and for that I'll call to the stage Sylvia Stead, the chair of the NNA Board of Governors and Vice Chair Yann Pinault. Avant de commencer la présentation des prix, j'inviterai sur scène Sylvia Stead, la présidente du Conseil des gouverneurs du CCJ, et le vice-président Yann Pinault. Hello, everyone. We are thrilled to announce that for the first time, we are naming two awards after giants in our industry who have had long and stellar careers as journalists. Each won a National Newspaper Award. Their awards will be named after them. The Norman Webster Award for International Reporting and the Claude Ryan Award for Editorial Writing. We want to thank the Webster and Ryan families and the Board of Le Devoir for their support 
and recognition of the importance of quality journalism in our society. Nous sommes ravis d'annoncer la création de deux prix qui porteront les noms de deux géants du journalisme canadien qui ont eu de longues et brillantes carrières et qui ont remporté chacun un prix au concours canadien de journalisme. Les prix porteront le nom de prix Norman Webster pour les reportages internationaux et de prix Claude Ryan pour la rédaction d'éditoriaux. Nous remercions les familles Webster et Ryan et le Conseil d'administration du Devoir pour leur soutien et leur reconnaissance de l'importance d'un journalisme de qualité dans notre démocratie. In a, in a few minutes, when the awards are announced, we will be inviting one of Claude Ryan's sons, Patrice, and Norman Webster himself to the stage to present the awards named after him, after them. Nous inviterons dans un moment sur scène le fils, un des fils de Claude Ryan, Patrice, ainsi que Norman Webster, afin de présenter les prix nommés en leur honneur. La guerre en Syrie a été couverte sous plusieurs angles. Mais dans une série d'articles pour la presse, Isabelle Haché a pris elle-même des risques pour nous offrir une perspective unique. Elle est allée au-delà de la guerre en tant que telle pour examiner des questions complexes de conflits ethniques, gouvernance et féminisme dans cette région divisée. Son incursion profonde en Syrie lui a permis de trouver des êtres fascinants, ainsi qu'une perspective canadienne bouleversante. Les juges ont dit que même si son affectation la mettait en danger quelquefois, Isabelle Haché n'a jamais perdu son souci de faire du bon journalisme. Les nouvelles qu'elle a dénichées sont captivantes. « C'est beaucoup plus qu'un reportage sur la guerre », ont dit les juges. « C'est un reportage sur l'humanité ». Stephanie Nolan of the Globe and Mail takes great risks, both physical and psychological, to cover the most important things happening in South America. From stories at the heart of the news agenda to stories readers might otherwise never hear about. Her submission in the international category included accounts of suicide, political crisis, and desperation in three South American countries. A story that explored why indigenous adolescents in Brazil take their own lives at a rate 22 times higher than the suicide rate among non-indigenous Brazilians required enormous persistence and determination. And it offered heartbreaking parallels with indigenous communities in Canada. Judges said Nolan's work proved the value of having correspondence on the ground far from home. A secretive system of Communist Party justice. Members of a Muslim minority quietly taken away for political indoctrination. These are some of the stories the Globe and Mail's Nathan Vanderclip uncovered as he reported on China in 2017. A story on torture tactics being used in a crackdown on corruption exposed in vivid detail an issue that no other Canadian journalist had explored. Judges said it was an in-depth and compelling piece of journalism that held the reader's attention until the very end. In another story, Vanderclip described what happened when he found himself detained by China's secret police. It's for your own good, he was told. Judges described the account as absolutely gripping. And the award goes to La Gagnante et Isabelle Haché. I wish they wouldn't call us giants. Um, I think we've been shown this week, uh, the week of press day, which was, uh, to which we uh, pay great homage these days, and so, so we should. There's a tremendous number of really fine, really courageous, really terrific journalists out there doing a job 
and all of us should be on their, on their tail to do more because the world needs it. I don't want to be too, uh, too maudlin, and so I'll wind up quickly. Uh, uh, Mr. Ryan was a great friend. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> I was old enough to uh, qualify to some of his excursions. Uh, I remember him riding in my backseat of my Volkswagen. Uh, I remember him uh, sitting in the corner office, the corner chair of his office, uh, dispensing wisdom. Um, he was the only man, I think, who could assert quite happily at public functions that he had spent his holidays reading the diaries of Lafontaine and Bert Baldwin. <laughs> the Baldwin Lafontaine. Um, alors, merci, merci tout le monde. Uh, je suis fier. C'est un honneur pour moi de, de recevoir un tel prix. Um, je, dois, je dois ajouter une petite chose. Uh, je demeure présentement à Sainte Catherine de Hadley, c'est vrai, mais il faut uh, ajouter que chaque jour je lis le devoir à papier. And that's it. Thank you. Ben, je voudrais remercier euh, d'abord mes patrons à la presse de me soutenir depuis euh, presque 20 ans. Éric Trottier, euh, Alexandre Pratt sont toujours là, euh, toujours enthousiastes quand j'ai des projets de reportage. Euh, Ce n'est pas le premier prix du journalisme qui est gagné pour euh, couvrir la guerre en Syrie. Vraiment pas. Je me souviens que ma collègue Michel Ouimet qui a pris sa retraite euh, cette année, il a gagné un prix il y a quelques années déjà. L'année dernière, il y avait euh, Mark McKinnon du Globe and Mail avec sa superbe euh, série qui était extraordinaire, euh, qui a gagné aussi. Euh, J'espère juste que ce soit la dernière fois qu'on gagne. Pas parce qu'on n'aura plus d'intérêt pour la guerre en Syrie, mais parce qu'un jour, il va y avoir une fin à ce conflit-là. Euh, on m'a dit d'être amusant et bref. On nous a tous dit d'être amusant et bref. Je ne sais pas comment on peut être amusant avec la guerre en Syrie, mais je vais être brève, alors merci. One day last July was a bad day for bumblebees. That's how Kate Allen of the Toronto Star began her deeply researched and engagingly written account of what could be an overwhelmingly complex yet crucial subject, how climate change is throwing relationships among animals, plants, and territory into increasingly unpredictable disarray. The Great Global Species Shakeup looked at the effects of climate change not so much on humans but on other residents of this planet, from bees to shrubs. Using every tool at her disposal, including well-designed multimedia elements, Allen adroitly drew readers into an ever-widening picture of scientists racing to understand these unprecedented, and for some species involved, including humans, potentially catastrophic developments. Hunters, tourists, conservationists, photographers, outfitters, ecotourism operators, politicians, and local residents all of them claim a piece of British Columbia's most iconic forest animal, the grizzly bear. With new restrictions on hunting about to take effect, Larry Pinn of the Vancouver Sun offered a thorough and engaging look at the complex coexistence of people and bears in the Bella Coola Valley, ground zero in the debate over the bear hunt. Thoroughly researched and broad-ranging, Pinn's article explored the sometimes inconvenient facts about the life of grizzly bears, as well as some of the possible consequences of a ban on trophy hunting. Judges said it was a model of explanatory journalism, readable, informative, and thought-provoking. We hear many stories these days about hate and intolerance against religious groups, ethnic groups, and immigrants. As offensive remarks get reported on, it's easy to just assume the worst. The Toronto Star's Jennifer Yang had the courage to go beyond the standard interpretation as she delved into whether an imam who came under attack for anti-Semitic remarks had actually said what he had been accused of saying. Yang found many surprising shades and many layers of gray. Her story was an attempt to slow down, to consider all the facts in an apparently routine news story. 
and to realize what reality lies in the details. Judges said her approach offered an example for other journalists to follow. And the award goes to Kate Allen. Uh, thank you. Um, it was a huge honor to be nominated in this category with the other reporters. And I have to dedicate this to Jenny Yang, who's my work wife. And the only reason I work at the Star, she convinced me to come uh, do the one-year internship program there a while ago now. And uh, she's part of a crew of women that I work with um, who I just love. A lot of them are here tonight. And we all we read each other's stories before they run. We workshop each other's leads and we make each other's work better, we support each other, and I feel like a win for one of us is a win for all of us, so shout out to you guys. Um, thank you also to my editor, Doug Cudmore, and my team editor, Matt Carter, and um, uh, also David Schnittman and Cameron Tulk, who made this story look beautiful. Um, I'm a science reporter, and there's not that many of us left, and I'm very, very grateful to be on the science beat. And uh, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> uh, not only, it's such a fun beat, and I'm so grateful that the star lets me keep doing it. And not only do they let me keep doing it, but when I tell them that I need to fly across the country to see about a bunch of dead whales, they always let me do it. Uh, so I'm very, very grateful for that. Or when I say that I'd like to spend several months working on a story about climate change and shifting species ranges, they're all for it. So thank you to the star. And last of all, thank you to my husband, Joseph, and my baby, Louis, who are back there. <laughs> um, <laughs> Joseph is the best partner in the world. Well, I literally would not be here, like right here, if he wasn't there. So <laughs> thank you to Joseph. Producing high-impact visual stories online can take hundreds of hours and require fine-tuning hundreds of lines of code. The Globe and Mail set out to create a new framework that cut development time to a fraction. The framework, built by interactive editor Jeremy Agius with art director Matthew French, allows editors and visual journalists to turn around big projects in weeks instead of months and have them work on any user platform. Two examples submitted by The Globe tell the stories efficiently and beautifully through a sensitive flow of photography, typography, and graphics. And the visuals in a piece about condos being flipped make the issue more digestible and show clearly what happens in a speculative real estate market. Caroline G. Murphy, du Journal de Montréal, s'est rendue dans le cercle polaire dans le cadre d'un voyage dans l'océan Arctique, célébrant le 150e anniversaire de la Confédération. Voyage au bout de la glace, un micro-site créé spécifiquement pour la présentation de son reportage, présente la pure beauté de l'Arctique, de même que le désarroi de la faune dû au changement climatique. Le reportage est composé de chapitres et utilise une collection impressionnante de formats, chacun d'entre eux adapté à la trame narrative. Les juges ont dit qu'on pouvait presque sentir la brise froide du large, comme si on était du voyage, et profiter d'une impression inoubliable de l'Arctique. An Iraqi photojournalist provided the Toronto Star with arresting images of elite Iraqi soldiers committing war crimes in the name of justice. The scenes of brutality, ranging from torture to the summary execution of an unarmed, bound detainee, were horrific, but also necessary to document. The design mission was simple. Ensure that the visuals amplified the star's own reporting about the images. A discomforting but important story unfolds through effective use of imagery, hierarchy, and type selection. Victims of the soldiers are introduced as brothers, sons, and mothers. Readers are given the choice of whether to view the most disturbing material. Judges said it was powerful yet sensitive, 
haunting, but very effective. And the award goes to Jeremy Agius and Matthew Frank. Well, thank you. This uh, is really an honor. Um, there's some incredible stuff that we saw there. Um, you know, to me, this was a, a chance to not just look at uh, how to package things up more quickly, but to really sort of uh, become more expert in our understanding of how to tell stories uh, visually, uh, how to package things together, how to structure things, how to think the way a reader experiences things, and to be able to do that quickly. And uh, I think that these are the types of thinking and experimentation that are going to take visuals and give them more power, uh, especially as everyone carries around a little tiny computer in their pocket. Uh, so, you know, all, all the thanks goes to uh, the, the Globe for allowing us to be able to do these experiments. Uh, to Jason Chu and Matt Frainer, uh, to David Wamsley, Philip Crawley, uh, being able to get to do this is an absolute privilege, and uh, I cherish it. Thank you. He said it all. So. <laughs> In a provocative and fascinating tale, Eric Andrew G. of the Globe and Mail disassembles and attempts to reconstruct the disputed and tangled indigenous heritage of renowned Canadian author Joseph Boyden. He unravels Boyden's self-proclaimed indigenous past with extensive research and skillfully scrutinizes clues to the author's ancestry. Judges said Andrew G. demonstrates an artful and authoritative voice while providing provocative insights into what constitutes an indigenous identity in Canada's age of reconciliation. The piece offers a nuanced take on a complex situation, laying out the facts and resisting judgment in the best journalistic tradition. Many people have experienced frustration when concert tickets sell out in a flash, then reappear on the secondary market for triple the price. Robert Cribb and Marco Chown Ovid of the Toronto Star diligently followed a thread in the leaked Paradise Papers to expose the profits that are earned by ticket resellers, manipulating sales for concerts by some of the world's most popular performers. Undertaking extensive research and data analysis, Cribb and Ovid shine a spotlight on a ticket scalping scheme of epic proportions. Judges said, this is public service journalism at its best, a thorough expose of a scam that touches the pocketbook of anyone with an interest in live entertainment. Stephanie Nolan, the Globe and Mail's correspondent in Latin America, went to Argentina's National Library to see how Canadian writer Alberto Manguel was faring as the institution's new director. She discovered that Manguel was a divisive figure in Buenos Aires. Her intriguing profile doesn't draw conclusions for the reader, but instead, offers a carefully balanced account. Nolan presents an absorbing, nuanced portrait of Manguel, deftly giving a voice to his detractors while simultaneously creating empathy for the director. Judges said, Nolan's practiced eye for color gives readers a sense of the climate in which Manguel must operate and exposes how he must navigate a job rife with political intrigue and bias. And the award goes to Eric Andrew G. Wow. Um, I guess I, I have a few people to thank. Dennis Shawkat and Craig Offman, my editors who put me up to this. 
and uh, Carol Toller, who handled the piece in editing and was brilliant, um, to the Globe and David Walmsley, who uh, you know, I took a really long time to write this. <laughs> And uh, that's not always possible in newspapers, but uh, the, the Globe does give a, a ton of rope to, uh, to people to do pieces like this, and, and uh, I couldn't have done it anywhere else, I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, and, and I think above all to um, all of the indigenous people, uh, thinkers, leaders, uh, just ordinary folks who were my sources for this piece above all, and uh, who provided whatever insight uh, I was able to put across in the piece. Thanks. Child abuse inflicted by Roman Catholic priests has become an all too common bad news story. Finding a new way to treat the dismal subject matter is a challenge. Grant LaFleche of the St. Catherine Standard rose to that challenge, skillfully outlining the reach these abuses have had in his community and on the lives of the victims. Their stories are told delicately in clear, crisply evocative prose. The man at the center of LaFleche's series suffered the unthinkable at the hands of multiple priests. The reporter follows his journey from the confines of a jail cell to the difficult path towards redemption. Judges said this submission captured the essence of the terrible tale, recounting it with both impact and compassion. Ontario's prison system is now the focus of a major reform effort, triggered in part by Randy Richmond's exposure of the scandalous conditions and mismanagement at a local detention centre. Prisoners form an easily ignored segment of society, but the London Free Press journalist hasn't forgotten about them. He exposes the cataclysm wrought by fentanyl, as well as the brutal and inexplicable murder of an inmate at the hands of his cellmate. Richmond's relentless reporting unpacks scandal and terrible management at the jail. Judges said the series was enterprise reporting at its best, powerfully written, richly documented and compelling accounts of significant, hard-to-get stories that hold authorities to account and demand action. Assisted dying has been in the Canadian consciousness since the advocacy and death of Sue Rodriguez in the early 1990s. After medical assistance in dying was made legal in 2016, a series of stories by Amy Smart of the Victoria Times Colonist put a human face on the significant obstacles that Canadians still face when seeking to end their lives as their quality of life declines. With eloquence and compassion, SMART exposes the barriers that exist for citizens in British Columbia, including a refusal to provide the service because of religious beliefs. She elevates the local experience to national relevance and adds depth to a conversation that will only increase in prevalence as the Canadian population ages. The award goes to Grant LaFleche. I, uh, look at some of the work done here tonight and I feel a little bit like the kazoo player who's been asked to jam with the Beatles, so I actually wrote it down so I wouldn't forget what it was I was supposed to say. Um, not to bore you with thank yous, but I do want to thank my editor, Angus Scott, who's sitting in the back. I work at a, and this will be familiar to most of you, an understaffed, overworked newsroom that always seems like it's going to fly apart at the seams, so um, I'm grateful that Angus always gives me the time to do uh, investigative pieces which is not easy in a newsroom our size. Um, I guess the thing I want to say about this piece, and that's Father Greco, a guy who abused a man I wrote about named William O'Sullivan. And this was somebody who suffered systemic and repeated rape at the hands of people he was supposed to be able to trust. And th the trick behind this story was not to dumb down that language, not to use euphemisms 
to make it sound like something that would be more palatable to our readers. So it wasn't an easy story to write, nor was it easy for people to read. And I just want to again thank Angus for giving me the opportunity to write it that way. And the last thing I'm going to say, not to bore anybody with a long speech, is just newsrooms our size have taken a real hit as cutbacks in our industry have made it more difficult for us to do daily journalism, never mind uh, invest the resources to do this. So the only thing I want to say to all of you tonight is, is we face a lot of challenges as an industry, and there are fewer of us on the front line than there were even a decade ago. Um, but you know, Edward R. Murrow used to say, difficulty is not an excuse that history will accept. And we just have to keep doing the work that we're doing, no matter the circumstances, so long as we're able to do it. So thank you and merci. In a photo called Pinhead, Mike Deal of the Winnipeg Free Press captured an image of Jamal Begg and the pins he collected while volunteering at the Canada Summer Games. Judges describe this as an untraditional portrait. The young man's eyes looking straight into the camera and the details on the brim of his ball cap grab the viewer's attention and leave one wondering about the story behind each of the pins. The Ottawa citizen's Ashley Fraser went to a popular surfing spot on a day of heavy, eerie fog. She found Brent Schmidt ripping it up on a freestanding wave just off the island. Judges said there was power in the simplicity of this black and white image. The foggy background removed any landmarks, leaving the surfer alone on the water. The angle of the surfer and his surfboard echo the shape of the wave. Olivier Jean de La Presse a pris cette photo de fumigation d'abeilles avant que leur ruche soit transportée dans le champ. Les juges ont dit qu'un mystère entoure cette photo puisqu'on se demande ce qui se passe. La symbiose de ce mystère, avec l'atmosphère morose, les nuages, la lumière et la qualité du cadrage, a fait en sorte que cette photo a été sélectionnée parmi les trois meilleurs de la catégorie de la photo de reportage. And the award goes to Olivier Jean. Thank you very much. I was um, really happy and just honored to be nominated. Um, news photographer in press room are like bees, um, I guess a dying breed. But I'm lucky that my bosses still believe that uh, press photographers are um, strong storytellers still. Thank you. Have a great evening. The Hamilton Spectator's comprehensive investigation of concussion damage among football players was both compelling and socially significant. The participation of McMaster University researchers from several disciplines made the four-part series even more authoritative. Reporter Steve Bust deftly turned the science of concussions, including their long-term effects, into accessible prose. The findings from Collision Course are horrifying. Brain scans from retired players in their 40s look like those of men in their 80s. Having the players tell their own stories on video provided a haunting human element. This series, which spanned more than two years from conception to publication, is a journalistic effort that might truly make a difference. Marty Klinkenberg's series on the suicide of a young Canadian bull rider has all the elements of great journalism. An important issue? Hard work, sensitivity, insight, and great writing. Klinkenberg tracked down friends and family of the writer across the far-flung bull riding community. He won their trust, gathered their stories, and captured the essence of their profession with understanding, beauty, and stark clarity. This is more than another story about the danger of concussions in a risky sport. 
It is also a compelling tale of a family, a Canadian community, a culture, and a sport most of us know little about. A powerful story, well-researched and well-told. Sunaya Sapurji of The Athletic has reported on junior hockey for more than a decade, but it was buying a first pair of skates for her two-year-old son that prompted her to ask the question, how do countries other than Canada develop hockey players? Traveling to Europe and the United States, she brought a keen sense of observation, methodical research, rigorous work on the ground, and strong writing to her series, Grassroots to Gold. The series challenges us to re-examine how we teach our national sport, and it reminds us that the joy of play is what attracts kids to sports in the first place. And the award goes to Steve Bust. Yeah, that's an okay song. <laughs> wow. So they told us uh, not to make this just thank yous, um, but for reasons, extenuating circumstances, I'm afraid I'm gonna have to go against that a little bit. So thank you to Diana, the poor woman who has to live with me, uh, to uh, Neil Oliver, who uh, believed in this project and put his financial support, or the spectator's financial support behind this project. Two and a half years is a long time to work on something. Uh, Paul Burton, Cheryl Steppen for giving me the freedom to do projects like this. Jim Poling, my friend, my mentor, he's always had my back. I have to thank the researchers that worked with me at McMaster University and St. Joseph's Healthcare. Uh, they did this and kept this project alive because they were committed to it. But most importantly, I have to thank the players, the retired players who volunteered for this project. These guys didn't do this for any other reason than they just wanted to help, and they wanted to help the people that are still playing this sport. A lot of these guys know what's gonna happen to them. I know that when I talked to them, I could see the fear in their eyes, but they wanted to do this to try to at least help in some way, and I wish that I had had better news to tell them. Uh, so thank you very much. Twenty-five years ago, a man from Sudbury, Ontario, became fascinated with the monuments that dot the Canadian landscape, like the Big Nickel in his hometown and the Big Easter Egg in Vegreville, Alberta. Ed Salonica created a website chronicling these roadside attractions. Katie Dobbs of the Toronto Star set out to interview him, only to discover he had died in 2015. His family had decided to keep the website alive in his memory and Dobbs dug deeper to produce what judges called a profoundly touching piece. Her story tells how one man dedicated himself to documenting Canada's roadside attractions, and in the process, helped Canadians see what makes the country so special. Richard Warnica of the National Post sensed an anger and an energy among followers of Rebel Media and its founder, Ezra Levant. For months, he delved into everything he could find about the rebel, uncovering ties to extremist movements in Europe and the United States, as well as some top figures in the Conservative Party. Friends, fans, former colleagues, and critics of Levant explained why he just cannot seem to stop himself from going too far. Judges said Warnica wrote elegantly about Levant's furious involvement with some of Canada's most important institutions. They called it a nicely drawn portrait of a man who skated for years on thin ice before plunging through to the darkness below. Jesse Winter was working as a reporter in Yukon when he met Gabriel Smarch in 2013. Smarch had called to complain about the terrible state of the building he lived in, but later revealed that his uncle had raped him when he was five. That conversation started a four-year reporting odyssey 
that culminated when Winter finally wrote the story for the Toronto Star. His powerful piece traces the heartbreaking life of a child who was let down by family, community, the justice system, and government. Painstakingly reported, detail by tragic detail, and told in a succinct, almost staccato prose, Winter's story has Gabriel reaching adulthood, feeling damaged nearly beyond saving. The award goes to Jesse Winter. Wow. Um, I obviously have a lot of people I need to thank for this. Um, I won't put you all through their names one by one because there's far too many to thank over a four-year project, but I definitely need to thank, first of all, my editors at The Star for giving an intern the opportunity to work on a story like this. Uh, David Bruiser, in particular, who probably read, I think, a dozen drafts of this story before he would even let me show it to the bosses. Serena Willoughby, John O'Hayan, Janet Hurley, all of them, they worked really hard to make this piece sing. I need to thank Mike Thomas, who was my photo editor at the Yukon News when I began this project, and he gave me all the time in the world to work on it. But most importantly, I need to thank Gabriel. This, was, this is his story. As, as the intro said, he'd been calling the newsroom over and over again, and for some reason was going through to a phone that wasn't staffed. When he finally got through to me, he said, I have a story that you really need to hear, but I'm not calling back again. You need to come right now. So I got in my car, and I drove up to his house. And we did the story about the apartment building, and then he told me what his uncle had did, and I had no idea that I would spend the next four years working with him to put this piece together. He worked just as hard on this as I did. There were times I wanted to quit, there were times he wanted to quit, um, and this is as much his award as mine. Thank you all very much. Forest fires are difficult to cover. You must not only stay ahead of the blaze to capture firefighting images, you must also be behind it to record the aftermath. Add rugged BC terrain and the challenge only increases. Daryl Dick's powerful image of a mother clutching her eight-year-old daughter at the charred remains of their remote First Nation home conveys their loss and suffering. The eye settles on the woman and child, then roves across the charred remains and the still intact swing set before returning to the victims. Nature took their home, but also provided the evening sunlight that etches the tragedy on the woman's face. Hundreds of asylum seekers risked freezing temperatures, arrest, and unknown fates to make their way into Canada from the United States in early 2017. This image by Ian Wilms shows an asylum seeker claiming to be from Nigeria. His eyes are trained on a new land, his hopes and dreams mixed with fear and uncertainty. This image captures the desperation of an individual fleeing to a new country in the cold, dark night. The angle of view, the dramatic lighting, and the black and white presentation make this a powerful statement. Great photojournalism like this compels the reader to ask, why is this happening? Three members of a church in Edmonton, including the pastor's wife and a mother of four, were killed when a thief fleeing police in a stolen truck crashed into a passing minivan. Two days later, the church congregation worshipped together for the first time after the crash. Larry Wong's image of congregants mourning the dead captures their grief and anguish with gripping emotion. The looks on the faces, and the sight of two women lying prostrate on the floor provide a stunning glimpse of the aftermath and impact of the crime. One cannot help but empathize with the grief-stricken mourners. The award goes to Ian Wilms.
Sorry, I'm a little slow getting up here. I got a bit of an accessory to hang on to. So thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, first and foremost, I have to thank Mo Douaron, who is a fantastic photo editor and a longtime supporter of my work. Uh, really, this photo would not exist if it weren't for him. So you know, I'm very. It's 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 really important as a, a young photographer and a freelancer to have people out there in the industry uh, who are in a position to support your work, especially when you have a specific vision for it that might not typically fit into the news cycle. So uh, in this case, it was a bit of a perfect storm for us, and I was really grateful to have the opportunity. Uh, it was also a wonderful story to work on, and one that I hope that uh, a lot of the folks in this room continue to work on. It's definitely not something that's uh, gone by, and the, the, the tide has not uh, gone out for the refugee story. In fact, I think there's a lot more work to be done so thank you for that. And it's an honor to be working with the Globe and Mail on content like this because uh, there aren't very many publications uh, left that, that are willing to take a chance on more immersive storytelling. So thank you very much. Appreciate it. Serge Chapelot de La Presse est au sommet de son art depuis des années, tout en conservant sa malice et sa vivacité d'esprit. S'inspirant de références culturelles, il se moque de l'inhabileté de la ministre Mélanie Joly à s'exprimer clairement, ainsi que des prétentions régaliennes de Donald Trump qui apparaît tel un roi confus du trône de fer. L'humour polisson de Serge Chapelot est toujours présent dans ses dessins. Harvey Weinstein représenté sous forme de pénis, une compétition entre Donald Trump et Kim Jong-un pour savoir lequel a le plus gros missile dans ses pantalons. Une observation sur la similitude de Jagmeet Singh à travers le regard d'une Marge Simpson subjuguée. Les caricatures de Serge Chaplot visent juste, tout en nous faisant rire. Bruce McKinnon's work for the Halifax Chronicle Herald is characterized by powerful images bearing ethical, moral, and political messages. After the Las Vegas shootings, he shows Uncle Sam protecting a pro-gun campaigner, while all around lie victims in pools of blood. McKinnon's depiction of singer Gord Downey poignantly portrays the autumn of a Canadian icon, as his clothes turn into falling maple leaves. An obsequious Donald Trump offers up an American turkey on a plate to a drooling Russian bear. The vulnerability of the world in the age of Trump is depicted by a globe on the head of a matchstick. Sears creditors are predators staring down their prey, a lone pensioner. These are powerful, uncompromising images that immediately convey unambiguous messages. Using few words, Malcolm Mays of the Edmonton Journal conveys powerful messages about politics and society. He confronts national, international, and regional issues with an admirable economy of expression. A terrified burka-clad woman, locked in a fleur-de-lis executioner's block, offers biting commentary on the heavy hand of the state and the vulnerability of minorities. Mays draws Harvey Weinstein's Oscars as see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil capturing Hollywood's complicity in the sexual abuse scandal. Kim Jong-un and Donald Trump having access to nuclear buttons leads everyone else to reach for the panic button. Closer to home, he notes the apparent toppling of rebel media founder Ezra Levant and the menace the conservative movement in Alberta poses to the province's LGBTQ community. The award goes to Bruce McKinnon. I was just talking to one of the uh, former organizers here, Lorraine, and she assured me that uh, the editorial cartooning category was judged on hairstyle. <laughs> so I fully didn't expect to be up here. Uh, 
I, and I didn't realize that we weren't supposed to just do thank you, so I, I, that's all I got. Um, I want to thank uh, Sarah Shaplow, first of all, for not winning. Uh, <laughs> Sarah holds some kind of record at, at the NNAs, I'm pretty sure. Well deserved, of course. I want to thank um, Malcolm Mays, a longtime friend. Uh, we got into the business at the same time, and uh, I've always uh, respected and, uh, and uh, been inspired by, by his cartooning. So thank you very much, Malcolm. Uh, and I'd like to thank um, who's let, well, my wife, Peggy, is probably the most important. <laughs> person to thank. And, uh, and the NRA and Donald Trump for uh, providing such a huge target for cartoonists and, uh, and for always being there for me on the slow news days. So thank you very much. Avant d'aborder la deuxième partie de la remise des prix, Un petit mot de remerciement à Post Media, notre commanditaire Platine, et à notre commanditaire premier, le Globe and Mail. N'oubliez pas votre dessert, mais si vous y allez, faites-le en silence parce qu'on va continuer. Uh, before we get started on the second half of the awards, just a quick word of thanks to Post Media, our platinum sponsor, and to our premier sponsor, the Globe and Mail, and feel free to visit the uh, dessert station quietly because we're going to continue with the show. Sean Fine, who covers justice for the Globe and Mail, examined Canada's judicial system after time limits on criminal proceedings were imposed by the Supreme Court. His careful examination of facts and issues provided a sobering view of the consequences of that ruling. Fine also wrote about a man who had been raped repeatedly as a child. The predator had been convicted, but ultimately released from criminal responsibility when the Supreme Court ruled the delay between charge and conviction was excessive. Judges said, if there ever was a story that gave voice to the voiceless, this was it. They also said, fine rights with deep understanding, humanity, and clarity, setting a standard all journalists should strive to emulate. Marina Strauss has covered retailing for many years at the Globe and Mail. Her clear and direct writing style makes her thoroughly reported stories accessible and compelling for a business audience as well as readers who might not spend much time in the business section. Who Killed Sears Canada was the definitive report about why the retailer failed and included stunning details about a disastrous decision the CEO made just before the holiday shopping season in 2016. Her submission also included in-depth coverage of internal strife at Tim Hortons, including the efforts of franchisees to preserve the brand following the sale of the chain. Judges said, Strauss writes stories readers can relate to. Caroline Touzain, de La Presse, s'est attaquée à une vaste gamme de sujets sur la santé en 2017. Dans « Course contre la montre », Elle décrit dans un style direct et rythmé comment une jeune victime d'agression à l'arme blanche a été sauvée par le corps médical. La nouvelle se lit comme un roman. Dans un reportage sur les boissons sucrées à haute teneur d'alcool, qui sont populaires auprès des jeunes, elle a révélé à quel point ce produit était dangereux. La couverture a poussé le gouvernement du Québec et les autorités réglementaires à changer la façon dont ces boissons sont vendues. Caroline Touzain a aussi abordé les changements historiques en cours dans le système hospitalier montréalais. Les juges ont dit que sa plume était claire et alerte et que son réseau de sources était bien fourni. Un bel exemple de journalisme spécialisé. The award goes to Sean Fine. When I look up at that photography, I have to give a shout out to my colleague Fred Lum. 
The, the, pow the power and the art of those pictures, just incredible, and, and gave the story an impact it couldn't have had otherwise. Um, as I look at all the award winners, I think we're all trying to do the same thing, which is to uh, make sure that people and events don't slip down a memory hole. Uh, Byron was one of the world's forgotten people, and um, it was a real privilege to be able to, uh, to tell his story for the Globe and Mail. Um, I want to thank, uh, are we allowed to thank people still? Uh, I, I want to thank um, my editor, uh, Christine Brousseau, who's down in the trenches with me every day. Um, uh, I want to thank um, uh, Dennis Choquette, my editor, for his inspiration. Sinclair Stewart for his uh, intelligence and insight, uh, David Walmsley for nurturing an environment in which we can do good work, and I just put my hand on this sticky candy. Um, <laughs> someone booby-trapped this, sorry. Um, and, uh, but above all, I want to thank my beautiful partner, Elizabeth, who is here with me. She has uh, stood by me uh, on her broken foot that won't heal, which is why she didn't get up there when I was trying to give her a hug. Uh, unwavering. Thank you. The three pieces submitted by the Globe and Mail's Lawrence Martin are stellar examples of what columns should be. Informative, entertaining, persuasive, and engaging. They provide profound insight and unique perspective on the complex issues engulfing American politics. With tight, clear prose and deft analysis, Martin identifies Donald Trump's elastic toughness, something that has escaped many of his critics. In another column, he blends insight with historical analysis to skewer George W. Bush's efforts to refurbish his tarnished presidency at the expense of Trump. In his third piece, he lifts the gauze from the purported objectivity of American journalism. Judges said all three pieces illustrate Martin's insight and powers of analysis. Melissa Martin of the Winnipeg Free Press brings delicacy authenticity, and a remarkable sense of openness to her columns. She is willing to expose her own vulnerability to help readers gain new insights into important subject matter. A column about spousal abuse allegations against a politician opens with a chilling description of her own history as a victim of domestic violence. She similarly offers a personal perspective on Harvey Weinstein's pattern of sexual harassment and on the advantages and disadvantages of Uber cabs. Such references to personal experience allow Martin to shine fresh light on difficult issues. Judges described her as an artist who crafts astonishing text out of raw material, demonstrating sensitivity and seriousness, but also humor. Paula Simons of the Edmonton Journal submitted three columns about the shocking case of Serenity, an indigenous girl from Alberta who died at age four from neglect, abuse and malnutrition. Simons demonstrates sensitivity and an abiding determination to obtain justice for the girl and her mother, who had both been abandoned and betrayed by a system that was supposed to protect them. With her straightforward and unadorned style, she casts a raw light on injustice and restores dignity to a mother who had no one else advocating for her. Confronted by an indifferent bureaucracy, Simons refuses to give up, she prevented authorities from turning a blind eye to the tragic fate of Serenity. Judges praised her determination and commitment. The award goes to Paula Simons.
Oh my goodness. Uh, <laughs> damn, I can no longer call myself the Susan Lucci of the National Newspaper Awards. You guys, I had all worked up my indignation and my outrage for my own self-pity, and now it's all wasted. Years ago, uh, I had a city editor. He was a great guy. This was not one of his greater moments. He said to me, when are you gonna stop writing stories about dead Aboriginal children? And I said, I don't know, maybe when they stop dying would be a good. I think that was about 10 years ago, and unfortunately, I've not yet been able to give up writing stories about dead Aboriginal children. But when I look back at some of the work that I did earlier on in my career, I see now that I wrote through a lens of a bit of a white savior complex. And some of these articles I look back on, I blush for myself because I think I really did feel when I was naive and green that these were my fights to win. With these three columns tonight, I really tried to give voice back to Serenity's mother. I've never been allowed to say her name because under Alberta's less draconian than they used to be, but still not great child welfare laws, I'm not allowed to say anything that would uh, allow you to recognize the names of her surviving children. But since we're not in Alberta tonight, I'm gonna say her name, her first name. Ashley entrusted me with this story a year and a half ago, and I have really tried to make it my mission to give her voice, to give her back the agency that the child welfare system took away from her, to let readers see that it was because of Ashley's courage, not my columns, that we were finally able to get some small measure of justice for this little girl who was tortured and sexually abused and whose story was swept away and, and, and covered up by the very RCMP and child welfare workers who were supposed to be looking out for her interests. So I want to thank you all, although as I say, I've been nursing a grievance for so long, I don't know, I don't know how to win. But, but thank you, I'm going to start trying to learn. Call this one, Me and My Shadow. Nathan Danette's photograph for the Canadian press of Elena Svitolina at the Rogers Cup is a lovely combination of timing, light, and shadow. Judges said, it was nice to see the photographer take a step away from the usual tennis shot and instead try for something a little more artistic. The light and shadow, the reach for the ball, the dynamic action flowing across the frame, all make for a wonderful composition and a beautiful picture. It's not often you see a wide-angle shot in sports that doesn't look too loose. In the case of this Michael Robinson photo for the New Brunswick Telegraph Journal, though, it's the wide angle that makes the frozen moment meaningful. You can just feel the athlete's split-second effort to keep the ball in bounds. Her expression, her hands reaching out, her pigtail flying, you can almost hear the referee's whistle and know that she's out of bounds, even before she lands. Ooh, that has to hurt. You may not notice the broken pinky finger right away, but the expression on the face of the player in the white shirt sends you right back to it. Andrew Francis Wallace's photo for the Toronto Star made judges laugh and feel queasy at the same time. The viewer's eye can't help but move from face to face to take note of the different reactions. The facial expressions of the three main players really engage. And then, there's that finger. The award goes to Andrew Francis Wallace. Uh, 
Uh, the picture is fairly self-explanatory. Uh, he did end up finishing the game. It took about a minute to tape it up, and there was no where, worse for the wear. I uh, simply just want to uh, thank the Toronto Star for giving me a home for the last uh, 12 years to do the type of work I've, I've done my, enjoyed doing my whole life. And then also uh, my manager, Tara Slonich, who uh, puts a lot of effort into keeping our department relevant with the uh, way the newsrooms are changing over the year. Thank you very much. When the Aurelia Packet and Times shut its doors after 147 years, the Globe and Mail's Marcus G. set out to investigate what the closure meant to the small Ontario city. Instead of interviews, however, he decided on a different course. Acting as if he were a local reporter, G. took in events that would have been covered by the now shuttered newspaper, from an announcement about a new waterfront development to the handing out of certificates to high school athletes. His eye for what residents would no longer read about in the Packet and Times resulted in a moving, beautifully written feature on one of the compelling issues of our time, the loss of local journalism in communities like Aurelia. A year after the Quebec City mosque shootings, many Canadians might have moved on, assuming everything that could be done for the victims had been done. With spare and unflinching language, Ingrid Peretz of the Globe and Mail shattered that complacency in her riveting story of one survivor's devastating experience that night at the hands of a mass murderer and through the year that followed. Having worked hard to gain the trust of Eamon Durbali and his family, Peretz avoided the maudlin and overwrought in her telling of this dramatic tale. Choosing details and words with care, she crafted a story that unspooled with deceptive simplicity and a powerful conclusion. Philippe Teixeira Lessard, de La Presse, a décrit la fin d'une époque pour une petite ferme familiale québécoise. Le reporter a illustré la vie de Normand Larose et Pauline Cloutier alors qu'ils terminaient à regret leur dernière traite, leur dernier encan et leur dernier jour comme producteurs laitiers. L'écriture est élégante et émotive. On peut sentir l'angoisse du couple qui abandonne tristement l'œuvre d'une vie alors qu'il n'y a pas d'acheteur ni d'enfant pour prendre la relève. Philippe Teixeira Lessard a rédigé un reportage touchant sur le dernier chapitre de la ferme La Rose Cloutier et dans un sens plus large à propos d'un mode de vie rural qui s'éteint peu à peu. The award goes to Marcus G. Uh, I have to begin just to tell you what a little bit of a mishap I had on the way here, so you have to forgive me if I read rather poorly because I was having a drink before this uh, and went in for a hug with Robin Doolittle and she broke my glasses. <laughs> so they're, they're broken. And uh, so my first thanks go to my wife, Kate, who brought some crazy glue in her purse to this event. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work, but... <laughs> Uh, thank you very much to this, but uh, I know it's a cliche to say it, but I really owe it all to my editors in this case. Uh, it was David Walmsley's idea after the shuttering of these newspapers to go to Aurelia and look at the packet of times, a uh, packet in times. And the, the packet, of course, was one of many small town papers that were killed off with the snap of the fingers, snap of the fingers last year. It was in publication for 147 years. And then one day, a suit came into the newsroom and said, it's over, guys. They didn't even get a chance to put out a farewell issue. Uh, I could have written a, a story about how sad it was to see small towns lose their papers. But my editor, Nicole McIntyre, had another idea. Go to Aurelia for a week 
and write about the, what the packet would have been covering if it still existed. Act like a local reporter, report what they would have reported. It was a classic illustration of the old saw, don't tell me, show me. And it brought home what this loss really meant to Aurelia. So thanks, Nicole. You're a model editor. You're a model editor demanding in the very best way. Thanks also to the packet reporters who went out of their way to help me uh, find the stories that they might have covered uh, if they hadn't just been thrown out of work. I'd like to dedicate this award to them and to all the small town reporters and editors across the country who labor to tell people what's happening in their communities. Thank you. It began with a report by David Aiken that Justin Trudeau would be out of the country as Canada rang in its 150th year as a country, and his office would not say where. Following up, Aiken and columnist Chris Selly discovered that Trudeau and family had been guests of the Aga Khan on his private Bahamian island. Repeatedly over the subsequent months, the National Post journalists were first to break new information on the story. By year's end, the Federal Ethics Commissioner found that Trudeau had violated conflict of interest rules. Judges said the persistent work of Aiken and Selly stood out in a highly competitive news environment. The Paradise Papers marked the largest leak in the history of journalism, but unlike past revelations about global tax havens, this disclosure of 13.4 million tax records was striking for the insights it revealed into the highest levels of power in Canada. In a series of exclusive reports, the Toronto Star's Robert Cribb, Marco Chown Ovid, and Alex Boutelier revealed where politics and the offshore tax haven industry intersect in this country. The coverage prompted a week of intense debate in Parliament, scores of investigations by the Canada Revenue Agency, and proposals for legislation to stem the loss of billions of dollars from tax coffers. Judges said the series represented a monumental work of investigative journalism. Noor Javid and Kristen Rishoi of the Toronto Star broke dozens of stories about dysfunction behind the scenes at the York Region District School Board. Their reporting shone a light into chaos and disarray at Ontario's third largest board, leading the education minister to order an investigation that found a culture of fear and a lack of ethical leadership. The board's director of education ended up being dismissed and a human rights office was established. Judges said the dogged work of Javid and Rishoi, particularly in the face of personal smear campaigns directed at them, was a testament to the power, impact, and importance of local journalism. The award goes to David Aiken and Chris Sauer. Uh, well, I would like to thank the, uh, the person who told me that Justin Trudeau went on vacation on the Icons <laughs> Island. Um, that's, that's most of it. I'd also like to thank... I'd also like to thank Anne-Marie Owens and everyone at the National Post for running a, a, a newsroom that's just a delight to work in um, every day, you know, in, in times that are tough. And it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, 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 it's the pleasure of my life to work for the National Post and, and um, this is a great, this is a great plaque to honor that. So, Dave. Good for you, Chris. Um, I, I'm three times with the National Post, Post Media. I keep leaving it to go work for TV and then I come back. I'm working for TV now, but if the Post, you're still here in a couple of years, I don't know, maybe I'll come back. First, Chris Selly, it's the first time I've worked with Chris. Let me tell you, he is punctual, 
He is always neatly dressed, and his spelling is impeccable. I want to work with Chris again. So thank you, Chris, for that. Just another thing, Marcus G. just came up here a second ago for writing about the Aurelia Packet and Times. That was my first daily newspaper, Marcus. And here tonight as well was my city editor at the Aurelia Packet and Times, Randy Richmond of the, Aurelia, uh, of the London Free Press. Randy, if you could stand up. Um, Randy's a Missioner Award winner, folks. From the Aurelia Pack and Times, the racket and crimes as we call it, uh, back in the day, the paper Stephen Leacock wrote about in Sunshine Sketches no longer exists. I grew up in Guelph. There was a paper there that lasted for 150 odd years, the Guelph Mercury, and it no longer exists. Newspapers are special things, very special things. And the work all of you do, the work I once did and one day may yet still do, is very special work. It's really important work. We're doing it on tablets and phones, and that's fine. There's a couple of digital-only entries tonight, La Presse and The Athletic, I think, are a couple of them. Keep it up. We have to hold people to account. That's what we do. This is category politics is about that. If there's copy editors in the room, and you're talking about this Justin Trudeau Agacon story, you've offended me by saying that he broke rules, that he violated guidelines. He's the first prime minister in our history to break the law. That's what our story was about. He didn't break a rule, he didn't break a lie, guideline, he broke the law. And his people didn't want to tell anybody about that. And we told that story. And that's what people do in Aurelia, or Thunder Bay, or Nanaimo, not so much anymore, all around the world. Please keep up the good work. I hope to come back to an NNA again in a couple of years. Jerry Nunn, if you'll hire me again, I don't know where Jerry is, thank you. I want to thank Jordan Tim, Anne Marie Owens, uh, my buddy John Iveson uh, in the uh, Ottawa Bureau, uh, and Jerry Knott. Thanks very much. The suicide of a Canadian bull rider turned a spotlight on what might be the world's most dangerous sport. Photographer Todd Coral spent weeks with the rider's closest friends on the bull riding tour, exploring how a way of life threatens the health and safety of the men who do it. Coral's photo essay for the Globe and Mail gives a behind-the-scenes look at the challenges rodeo cowboys face while pursuing a vocation they love. Judges said this was a complete package that combined clean composition with great storytelling. Coral exemplifies the tradition of documentary photojournalism by presenting a view one cannot get from the bleachers. Des milliers de demandeurs d'asile ont fui les États-Unis en 2017 de peur d'être arrêtés et déportés. Martin Tremblay, de la presse, s'est attaché à documenter l'histoire des migrants qui ont traversé la frontière se sentant menacés après l'élection de Donald Trump. Un grand nombre d'entre eux sont arrivés par un chemin de campagne qui relie l'État de New York au Québec. Les images de Martin Tremblay ont fixé des moments de grande émotion qui contribuent à la force de la trame narrative. Cette candidature s'est particulièrement distinguée par des images saisissantes représentant des migrants qui ont peiné pour se rendre à la frontière, avec des enfants qui assistent à l'arrestation de leurs propres parents. Les juges ont dit qu'on pouvait sentir leur accablement. Ian Wilms also documented the story of asylum seekers, in this case for the Globe and Mail. On a bitterly cold winter weekend, he followed 22 asylum seekers who crossed into Canada near the town of Emerson, Manitoba. To better capture the story, Wilms also visited Somali communities in Minnesota, from where most of the refugee claimants were coming. This story's chronology demonstrates the photographer's willingness to go in-depth as he chronicles the journey from a Minneapolis coffee shop to the border. The images capture with raw intensity the resilience and determination of those in search of a permanent and safe home. Judges said the decision to publish in black and white served the story well.
The award goes to Martin Tremblay. Je suis très honoré, euh, ému. Euh, moi, j'en profite pour remercier les lecteurs de la presse euh, qui nous ont suivis pendant 125 années et qui nous suivent toujours, même si nous avons arrêté d'imprimer notre journal. Et euh, la presse plus est un merveilleux outil pour les photographes. Et euh, ça nous permet aussi de faire des, des reportages photos et qui sont vraiment... Euh, une super place dans, dans la presse. Et merci à Eric Trottier et toute la direction de la presse de continuer d'investir et de croire en, au photojournalisme de qualité. Merci à, à Yann aussi qui a fait un excellent boulot. Euh, C'est un honneur d'être avec toi ici. Everyone knows that corrupt politicians, unethical executives and criminals use tax havens to hide their money from tax collectors, law enforcement, and even spouses. The Panama Papers, uncovered by an international consortium of journalists, made the extent of that shadow economy crystal clear. But it took additional digging by the Toronto Star's Robert Cribb and Marco Chown Ovid to discover something more surprising. Canada itself is a tax haven for foreigners looking to hide their money here. In the Star series, The Canada Papers, Cribb and Ovid combined painstaking research with clear, readable prose. Judges said this represented investigative journalism at its finest. Who picks our food? Many people might answer, who cares? But hands that pick your food a Toronto Star series on the use of temporary migrant workers in Canada might change that reaction. The series describes how Canadian growers depend more and more on these workers and their impact on the national and local economies. The Star journalists focused on the workers themselves, on how they are treated, and on their rights or lack of them. Judges said the skillful combination of large policy issues with personal and local details represented great research great reporting, and great writing. In other words, great journalism. When they discovered there was no national database tracking unpaid fines levied for breaking the rules governing stock trading, Globe and Mail reporters Grant Robertson and Tom Cardoso decided to take on the job themselves. One year and 6,000 files later, they reported violators had flouted at least $1 billion in fines from Canada's 13 regulators. Their analysis also pointed out to a potential solution. Very few individuals were responsible for half the unpaid fines, so collecting from them could have a dramatic impact in the world of securities. Judges said a tremendous amount of work went into finding the information, analyzing it, and transforming it into readable, if highly alarming, narratives. The award goes to Robert Cribb and Marco Chown Ovid. Thank you very much. This is a, an incredible surprise. And I got yours and you got mine. There we are. I uh, just wanted to say a quick word about collaborative journalism. And that's something that 
uh, Robert and I have been working on for a few years now, and it's something that I think is new, and it's something that we've invested in, and it's something that this award, I hope, recognizes is the future, or a potential future for this industry that's so starved for resources. And we have shown, or tried to show, I think, over the last few years about how working together isn't about uh, eliminating competition, and it isn't about uh, holding back scoops. But what it really means is that we end up with stuff that has greater impact, that has, and, and that really, in the end, becomes uh, greater than the sum of its parts. So I hope that this is an, a testament to the future of working together with collaborative journalists. Uh, in, in this particular case, this couldn't have been done without Radio Canada and CBC. Curious about how many allegations of sexual assault get classified as unfounded, Robin Doolittle of the Globe and Mail filed more than 250 Freedom of Information requests to police services across Canada. A database of the responses showed police concluded no crime had occurred in nearly one-fifth of the complaints, twice the frequency of other assault allegations. Doolittle also interviewed complainants and their families, investigating officers, and some alleged perpetrators. The 20-month investigation prompted police forces to re-examine thousands of files and reopen hundreds, and led Ottawa to provide new funding to combat gender-based violence. Judges said unfounded was an example of tenacious, methodical reporting that forces change. As one judge said, some investigations truly move the markers. This was one. Il n'a jamais été plus important pour les journalistes de découvrir la réalité qui se cache derrière les slogans politiques. C'est ce qu'a fait en long et en large une équipe de journalistes de la presse avec le Montréal des sans-papiers. Examinant l'affirmation du maire Denis Coderre selon qui Montréal était une ville sanctuaire, la presse a décrit la vie précaire et clandestine des familles de réfugiés qui tentent de survivre sans statut légal. La série illustre comment les réfugiés doivent lutter sans protection pour l'emploi, le logement, la santé et les services gouvernementaux, tout en se défendant contre les personnes qui tentent de les exploiter. Les juges ont dit que cette enquête était particulièrement importante puisque les réfugiés venant des États-Unis continuent d'affluer au Québec en quête précisément d'un sanctuaire qui, a démontré la presse, n'existe pas. Undercover in Temp Nation is a powerful account of the dangerous and potentially fatal risks faced by thousands of temporary workers. Sarah Moshtehedzadeh took Toronto Star readers into an industrial bakery where she worked undercover for a month alongside temporary employees who risked life and limb to bake and package bread. She and Brendan Kennedy also told the story of a woman who had been killed in an industrial accident shortly after beginning work at the bakery. The investigation highlighted the need for better protection of all temporary workers and better enforcement of occupational health and safety laws. Since its publication, moves have been made in Ontario to do just that. Judges said the story deserved praise for leading to meaningful change. The award goes to Robin Doolittle. This is so lovely. Um, it's not lost upon me that uh, for three years in a, a row, um, a woman has won the investigations category. With my colleagues Renata Delisio and Kathy Tomlinson. Um, yeah, I, I really want to thank um, our editor in chief, David Walmsley, for hiring me. 
Um, but for creating this culture at the globe that uh, demands excellence, it's ambitious, but it's also so supportive and collaborative and wonderful, so I feel very privileged to work there. Um, to Sinclair Stewart, um, this project would not have happened without you. You, at times, dragged me kicking and screaming to the finish line, and I'm grateful to you, uh, to my editor, uh, and boss, Dennis Chaquette. If you're ever lucky enough to have Dennis handle one of your stories, um, take it. Uh, you're just so talented and wonderful. Um, also an incredible guitar player who's open to playing 90s and 2000s pop songs, which is greatly appreciated. Um, a, a million people helped with Unfounded. I, I couldn't possibly name them all. I do want to acknowledge, um, uh, of course, Laura Blankensop, Michael Pereira, Jeremy Aegis, the multimedia team and data specialists who brought this reporting to life for Canadians, um, Lizanne and Vic and um, Kathy Mills, uh, my girl Galit, here, ready? And uh, Melissa, just such incredible um, photos and video for this project. So thank you so much, everyone. This is such a wonderful night, and I'm very grateful. A raging wildfire began a relentless march towards Waterton Lakes National Park in September, threatening the town site's 181 structures, including the iconic Prince of Wales Hotel. Brian Passifume of the Calgary Herald, Calgary Sun, arrived just as workers, residents, and tourists were being evacuated. He persuaded wardens to let him stay in the park and used his knowledge of area back roads to follow the dramatic battle against the flames. His stories, pictures, videos, and tweets, all filed by cell phone, thoroughly documented the unfolding disaster and provided a vital information lifeline for worried evacuees. Passifume's tenacity and round-the-clock reporting under chaotic conditions resulted in powerful, multi-platform coverage that judges said was unmatched in speed, authority, and context. The killing of six Muslim worshippers at a mosque in the Quebec City suburb of Sainte-Foy shocked Canadians and profoundly drove home the reality that Canada is not immune to terror attacks. A 10-person Globe and Mail team that worked the story from Quebec City, Ottawa and Toronto produced a robust package of powerful breaking news coverage that balanced getting information out quickly with the need for accuracy. Profiles of each victim included intimate details on the lives they had built in their adopted homeland. Journalists also provided a detail-rich suspect profile. The Globe and Mail's authoritative reporting helped take readers to the scene of the unfolding human drama. Judges described it as thorough and compelling. L'attentat d'un suprémaciste blanc au Centre culturel islamique de Québec à Sainte-Foy a causé la mort de six personnes et en a blessé 19. Au moment de la fusillade un dimanche soir, la presse n'avait qu'un seul journaliste en poste à Montréal. Mais des renforts sont rapidement arrivés dans les salles de rédaction à Québec et à Montréal pour assurer une couverture complète dans les heures qui ont suivi. Tous les angles ont été couverts dans des reportages détaillés. Les articles et encadrés ont été présentés avec des illustrations et des graphiques en ligne, dont l'édition tablette la presse plus. Les juges ont dit que la couverture, notamment les portraits émouvants des victimes, a été soutenue et complète et qu'elle a admirablement rendu compte de l'importance de la tragédie. The award goes to La Presse.
vous aurez compris que je suis ici, là, mais euh, je suis honoré, mais euh, c'est un travail collectif. Euh, ce soir-là, il y avait six journalistes qui étaient euh, sur, les événements, sur les événements comme tel. Euh, en 48 heures, il y a 35 jour journalistes et photographes qui ont, qui ont participé à la nouvelle. Euh, ce soir-là, c'est d'autant plus touché que c'est la, la, la grande mosquée de Québec où six personnes ont été tuées, c'était à cinq minutes de chez moi. Euh, le maire de Québec n'arrêtait pas de répéter sans cesse « pas à Québec, pas à Québec, c'est pas possible ». Mais euh, oui, c'était possible, comme à Paris, comme à Barcelone, comme à Nice, euh, comme à Toronto aussi, c'était possible. Euh, euh, on a... Les événements ont été... Euh, c'est l'événement qui a eu le plus de résonance, selon la firme Influence Média, l'événement québécois qui a eu le plus de résonance dans l'histoire récente du Québec. Euh, six, six personnes de entre 39 et 60 ans ont perdu la vie. Euh, ils ont laissé 17, euh, 17 orphelins de père. Euh, et puis, je, je voudrais, je, on pourrait dire, dans une autre situation, on pourrait dire merci à l'Académie, mais c'est pas, ce serait plutôt merci de nous avoir donné l'occasion de rappeler, d'avoir une pensée pour ces six personnes décédées. Merci. It started with a source revealing to Vancouver Sun reporters that a case filed quietly at the B.C. Court of Appeal had potential to make legal history. Philip Talio, a federal prisoner from a remote First Nation, was challenging his 34-year-old conviction for the murder of a child. If Talio's appeal were to succeed, he will have served longer than any other wrongfully convicted Canadian, longer, in fact, than David Milgard and Donald Marshall combined. Stories by Dan Fumano and Matt Robinson tell the gripping tale of Talio, who pleaded guilty to murder in 1984 as a troubled 17-year-old, then spent the next 34 years behind bars proclaiming his innocence. The case was blanketed by a far-reaching publication ban, which The Sun challenged. The reporters obtained hundreds of pages in sealed court documents. Ultimately, a judge lifted most of the publication ban and ruled Talio's appeal could proceed. The case continues. A woman was submerged in ice-cold water for almost half an hour after an accident on Canada's busiest highway. She died. And yet, thanks to incredible work by a medical team, she emerged from her ordeal alive and well. A tip about a feel-good story triggered a six-month investigation into how Ashlyn Krell's life was saved. Reporter Jane Sims and photographer-videographer Morris Lamont produced a seven-part series, 27 Minutes, that was by turns a science project, a story of faith, and a gripping and sensitive look into the lives of ordinary people doing extraordinary things. It became a tour de force in storytelling that allowed readers to experience the amazing efforts to save one fragile life. Sims wrote with such precision that it reads like an adventure novel. You can almost feel the biting wind and snow whipping along the highway. Judges said 27 minutes had everything you'd want in a story. Compelling drama, deep reporting, and a strong narrative. You might say that the Winnipeg Free Press entry for Project of the Year was actually for Project of the Century. Since 2004, the Free Press had been there every step of the way for the class of 2017. It was an ambitious 13-year journey to document the major and minor milestones of childhood and adolescence for a group of kids born in 2000, from their tooth gap kindergarten days to donning caps and gowns at high school graduation. Reporter Doug Spears and photographer Ruth Bonneville followed the children into their homes, sports fields, and workplaces, not to mention classrooms and schoolyards. They were there for the grade two field trip, the grade eight dance, and the high school highs and lows. Along the way, the kids were refreshingly honest about their life journeys. To Bonneville, 2017 brought an end to the assignment of a lifetime. 
a chance to take a close look at the normalcy of a child's life and see the greatness in it. The award goes to Dan Fumano and Matt Robinson. Um, thank you very much. This is obviously a huge honor. This First time here for both of us, and it's an honor just to be here. Um, I'll just tell one quick anecdote. Uh, so last year, as we heard there, um, our paper, the Vancouver Sun and Post Media, with, along with uh, the Aboriginal People's Television Network, sent uh, lawyers to court to argue uh, to lift this sweeping publication ban so that we would be allowed to uh, report freely on this case. Um, and then on the other side, arguing in favor of keeping the ban in place and keeping thousands of pages of material kind of sealed away from public scrutiny in the registry, there were lawyers, like more than a dozen lawyers for the RCMP, Corrections Canada, the Attorney General of BC, and a bunch of other entities. And there was one of the things our lawyer said, I was sitting there in court the last June, and one of the things our lawyer said that kind of stuck, up, stuck to me in this uh, particularly kind of dramatic turn of phrase, he said that he wasn't just there on behalf of these media companies. He said, behind me today are Canadians from the north, from the east, from the south, and from the west. And he said, those Canadians have not only an interest in uh, seeing how the administration of justice unfolds in their country, but they have a constitutional right to see it. And they rely on professional journalists to be able to see that. And um, happily, the judge agreed with him. So we were able to do this. I just wanted to go off paper and um, thank my wife, Ginny. Um, she, she helped me um, clarify my thoughts about why I think this case is important. Um, it's absolutely critical that we take a very close, hard second look and third look at, the, at uh, uh, interactions between Indigenous people and the criminal justice system. It really paid off for us. Um, we really appreciate uh, the support from our editors, including Harold Monroe, who decided to fight the crown on this publication ban. Thank you. Thank you. So we've been through all 21 categories, and what a fabulous collection of winners and finalists. But we're not quite finished. There's one more award to present tonight. Nous avons fait le tour des 21 catégories, mais il nous reste encore un prix à remettre. Je voudrais inviter à nouveau sur scène la présidente du Conseil des gouverneurs du CCJ, Sylvia Stead, et le vice-président, Yann Pinault. This is the fourth time we've paid tribute to a journalist of the year. One of the previous ones is here, Bruce McKinnon, um, along with the uh, ones who aren't here, Joanna Slater and Mark McKinnon. We added this award, award in 2015 because some journalism is so extraordinary it deserves additional recognition. Some stories are simply unforgettable and some journalists simply exceptional. So before Jan gives his, Start thinking about who, who you guess it would be, because I have no idea. C'est la quatrième fois que nous rendons hommage à un journaliste de l'année. Ces trois dernières années, Bruce McKinnon, Joanna Slater et Mark McKinnon ont été honorés. Nous avons ajouté ce prix en 2015 parce que certaines réalisations journalistiques sont si extraordinaires qu'elles méritent une reconnaissance additionnelle. So the people who decided this were a panel of past NNA winners. And we thought it was great that other working journalists would make this choice. So our panel for this year was Eve Boisvert, Jennifer Ditchburn, and Joanna Slater. We have formed a committee of ancient laureates of CCJ to choose the or the journalist of the year among the candidates. This prix is decerned by other journalists, active, 
qui prennent la mesure d'un travail journalistique de ce niveau. Notre distingué comité de sélection comprenait cette année Yves Boisvert, Jennifer Ditchburn et une ancienne journaliste de l'année, Joanna Slater. OK. Drum roll. And the winner is Robin Doolittle. Congratulations. I should probably apologize to Marcus for my spirited hug earlier. Um, I was just up here, so I don't have much more to say uh, other than um, I'm really grateful to my, my husband who is at home with our 10-month-old right now. And um, towards the end of my Unfounded project, I was pregnant and I found out I was having a girl and it just added this urgency to my reporting. So. To all the journalists in the room, we have about 16 years to fix the system before my daughter is, is hitting a scary age. So please take up that cause. Um, let's talk about it. Let's get real about this. And uh, I feel so privileged every day to, to be a journalist, to work in this industry. Um, and, uh, and I know all of you do too. So this is a really wonderful night. And yay, all of us. I'm not going to keep everybody from the party. Just a few closing words. Merci à tout le monde pour votre présence et félicitations aux lauréats et aux finalistes. We want to thank you all for attending and to congratulate the winners and the finalists. If you're a finalist, please pick up your certificate at the side of the stage. Si vous êtes finaliste, veuillez venir chercher votre certificat à côté uh, de la scène. Merci encore une fois uh, à Post Media et au Globe and Mail pour leur commandite. De même qu'à Glacier Media, the Winnipeg Free Press, the Toronto Star, Cision, Blakes, Versenis Jacobson, Alliance for Audited Media, News Media Canada, et La Presse Canadienne. Thank you, puis bonsoir.